Royce Buddha has one of the most important jobs at the High Court in Pretoria, South Africa. He's an interpreter who speaks 16 languages. In his job, he must convey not just words, but also cultures and customs. The apartheid system was abolished over 20 years ago, bringing an end to decades of institutionalized racial segregation and discrimination. Now, all South Africans have equal rights. And in court, people can choose which language to speak. Royce Buddha's task is to mediate between members of the judiciary and plaintiffs or defendants seeking their rights. It's 9 a.m. and Royce Buddha's working day is just beginning. Royce Buddha has worked for South Africa's justice system for over 30 years. His job is particularly important. Interpreters are needed in about 90% of cases. South Africa has 11 official languages, including English and Afrikaans. Trying to find them here, yeah, who's number one on the list today. Buddha is getting ready for his first case of the day. You know, as an interpreter, you jump into the shoes of the person who says the things. And you also put yourself in the shoes of the person who answers the question. And then your emotional expression will expose what exactly the person is trying to tell. <laughs> Today, Buddha will be interpreting from Zulu to English for the lawyer Dorel de Jong and her client Baba Mlangini, a traditional healer. OK, you can go in. Baba Mlangini was in a car accident and can't work. He wants compensation but doesn't have proof of prior earnings. Brother Mangeni, how are you? This is your lawyer from the law firm Franz Ketter, the ones fighting your case, right? Um, at the time of the accident in October 2012, you were a passenger. So the merits has been conceded. Please listen carefully. You were the passenger in that car and it was not your fault that the car ended up hurting you, was it? Okay, you sustained your, a comminuted fracture, right tibia fibula and a bump to your head. So the comminuted is when it's broken into little pieces. Mm. It's not like a break, it's little pieces, pieces. to his right leg. So the leg was broken, but not in the usual way. It was broken in a lot of places. Yes, it cracked. OK, so Mr. Malangeni, they, now we're coming to your claim for loss of earnings. You were working as a traditional healer. When the accident happened, you were working as a traditional healer? Yes. Okay, so now, because you don't have documentary proof of your income, that portion of damages is subject to a high contingency. You're a traditional healer, but don't have any pay slips. You don't write down how much money you make. You don't have bank statements. My brother, the road accident fund has to pay you money because the accident has denied you the ability to work. But you need proof of earnings. Anyone can come here and say they used to earn 50,000 rand. But the road accident fund can't just give out money without proof because the money belongs to the community, because it's us, the community, who pay taxes. Since you don't have any proof of earnings, some money will be deducted from your compensation, a contingency deduction, almost like punishment. This is the amount that they've offered now for loss of earnings. You can't go to the mountains to gather your medicine anymore. OK, so let's see what they're going to say. Then we'll come and speak to you again. We'll hear from them. They want to hand out the money, so they might increase it. Relax and sit here. In the end, it doesn't turn out well for Baba Mlangini. Because he can't provide any proof of income, the damages are reduced by more than a third. The outcome highlights the differences between the court and its rules and the way many South Africans live. 
Buddha and the other court interpreters move in both worlds. They understand both sides. At lunchtime, they tell jokes in Sepedi and eat traditional corn porridge with innards. You want to show these foreigners that South Africans eat a lot? We don't eat a lot. We eat well. There's no waste with us. We even eat the intestines. Even though many South Africans speak more than one language, it's unusual to speak 16 like Buddha does. He learned from relatives, friends and neighbors. Urdu, Arabic, Swahili, Nyanja, those are languages that I just pick up through having dialects with people, dialoguing with people around the streets, you know. I can tell you my head is very soft. It absorbs very easy. Buddha lives in the township of Mamalodi, which was set up by the apartheid government. At the time, it was a blacks-only area. It's also where he grew up. His family had a tough time. His father went into exile during apartheid and died abroad. His mother raised Buddha and his six siblings alone. Buddha first discovered his passion for languages on the streets of Mamalodi. This is A1, section A1. I grew up in A3. During the, the apartheid regime, people were grouped according to, to their languages. This side, mostly, you find the Sutu-speaking people, A1. Yeah, in A3, it's mixed. Fine, Zulu, Sutu, and Debele. Many of Buddha's friends grew up here too, and they still meet in the evenings. How is the funeral? Everything all right? How are you? I'm fine, thanks. What's wrong? It's bitter, right? <laughs> it's not alcoholic? Yes, and bitter. Not all of Buddha's friends were able to get on the career ladder like him. It's hard to get a well-paid job if you don't speak adequate English. And social inequality in South Africa remains a huge problem. Theoretically, every language is equal to the other. But practically speaking, it's not. There's still some people who speak a certain language who think they are bigger than the other one or superior than the other ones. Another day begins at the High Court. Buddha's first appointment is a meeting with Judge Ledwaba. The client is seeking damages, but her doctors say that she sustained severe head injuries and cannot handle her own affairs. Is a curator at large? Yes. Yeah. So what, what, what do you recommend? I recommend that the trust be created. The client wants to deal with the case and her money alone. The judge has to rule on how the case should continue. Buddha interprets from Indabele. The judge is saying that the money will be protected in a trust. It's still your money, but a trust will protect you and make sure that only you can have it. Does he understand? Do you understand? Yes, I do understand. But with all due respect, I have a request. Can I protect my own money? I am taking medication now, so I think I can cope. My question is whether this is possible. Judge, I was asking, I was asking judge, is it not possible for the money to be given to me? I will invest my money. How are, you going to invest? You invest How are you going to invest this money? I'm going to lock it away. I will keep it safe. I normally lock my money. Where are you going to lock it? In your bank? Will you lock it away at home? At the bank. 
I will lock it up in the bank. Yeah. If I give you 30,000 just to do your things, will you be happy? Will you be satisfied if the judge orders 30,000 to be transferred into your account and the rest be protected by way of a curator bonus? As we explained to you earlier, a curator bonus will work with you to secure and protect your money. Thirty thousand is okay. Well, Thirty thousand is fine. So a compromise has been found. Most of the money will be placed in a trust, but the client will receive thirty thousand rand herself. That's equivalent to eighteen hundred euros. One part of Buddha's work is to make sure that people understand each other's languages. But that's not all. He also has to explain a lot to his clients. Most see him as one of them. Most clients of Artemis really depends and rely on the interpreter to tell him the truth. Even though the attorney has told you what to tell the client, the client will always call you and say, what do you think? You are my brother. Tell me what do you think? You have to make him understand. You have to make him understand.